Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Connecticut Conference on Climate Change and Insurance, the panel on paying for resiliency. I'm Connecticut State Representative Carrie Wood, co-chair of the state legislature's Insurance and Real Estate Committee. I've spent much of my time as a legislator advocating for investments in renewable energy to help combat climate change. And I'm very excited to be moderating this panel. I'd like to thank the Connecticut Insurance Department and Commissioner Andy Mays for hosting this important conference on climate change. I'm here with a distinguished group of climate and insurance experts. I would like to begin by introducing the Washington Insurance Department Commissioner. Mike Kreidler is the state of Washington's eighth insurance commissioner. Since 2007, Commissioner Kreidler has chaired the National Association of Insurance Commissioners Climate Risk and Resilience Workforce. In 2015, Commissioner Kreidler joined the Paris Pledge for Action and his office became a supporting institution for the UNEP FL Principles for Sustainable Insurance Initiative, the largest collaboration between the United Nations and the insurance industry. I can go on about Commissioner Kreidler's expertise in this field, but I just want to say welcome, Commissioner, and we'd love to hear an introduction from you. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Representative Wood, and uh, also I'd like to extend my uh, appreciation to Commissioner Reyes for for inviting me to uh, at, to this conference, and uh, and congratulations uh, to him for for hosting this uh, first climate summit. I also want to uh, recognize uh, George Bradner. Uh, George uh, has been around for a long time, like I have, and is, has been a stalwart supporter of uh, raising awareness of, of uh, the nexus between climate change and insurance for some 20 years. So as long as I've been involved with the NEIC, uh, George has been there and helping. Uh, our topic is uh, paying uh, for resilience, which is a, a, a different animal than uh, paying for a loss. Uh, paying re for resilience is especially um, pre-paying for uh, a loss. Uh, it, it's a, an investment uh, in lowering the risk for loss. Mitigation um, is, is uh, mitigation can be uh, part of the equation that adds up, up to resilience. Um, cl climate mitigation includes economic opportunities, investing in green power, new construction methods, uh, new technology. Uh, we we uh, encourage insurers uh, to take risks uh, over the long term without threat without threatening solvency their solvency uh, through uh, state sustainability and with uh, green investments. Insurers have a big role to play in helping us to arrive in time uh, to a net zero world. Their investment is uh, and underwriting decisions are key to helping us on this pathway. As an insurance regulator for Washington State, my job is to make sure uh, insurers are adequately prepared for paying for, um, uh, for for losses. In addition, uh, they have the responsibility to disclose to investors, uh, consumers, employers, and, and uh, regulators how they manage uh, all material risks uh, to their business, including climate change. Many U.S. In, uh, insurers have been required since 2009 to report to, to the NEIC uh, it, it annually and uh, that, that about uh, how climate change affects uh, their business uh, and, uh, the, and it is part of what we call the Climate Risk uh, Disclosure Survey. We, we've uh, since moved uh, to, to encourage uh, insurers to, and equally accept TCFD uh, framework for reporting, which is more universal among business, particularly banking, uh, to have that for framework for reporting. The task force 
on climate-related financial disclosure and development uh, developed a framework to to help public uh, companies and others uh, uh, organize uh, disclosure uh, organize the uh, disclosure climate-related risks and opportunities for insurers. It is uh, d difficult uh, to transition uh, for to it, excuse me for insurers. It is not a difficult transition to TCFD reporting, which we are encouraging. Um, there's a substantial overlap between the survey uh, questions and the TCFD pillars. Mandatory TCFD reports uh, for many industries, including insurance, is almost a foregone conclusion in the future. Thank you for this opportunity to participate. Thank you very much. Next up, I'd like to introduce Liz Henderson. Liz is a catastrophe and climate risk specialist with 18 years of experience in risk analytics and strategic consulting for the US PNC insurance carriers at Aon. Liz leads the growth and innovation solutions team Liz also leads the climate change analytics group for Aon Reinsurance Solutions, creating new analytical insights for climate change risk in the U.S. Welcome, Liz, and we'd love to hear your introduction. Well, thank you um, for that, and thank you also for hosting this panel. Um, with the work that I do with our clients at Aon in the insurance industry, it is such a critical discussion around how do we support the industry um, in order to meet the rising requirements around things like climate change disclosures, but also it's a critical junction for insurers to make sure that we are active participants and leaders in the transition to support policyholders, homeowners, and business owners, making sure that they have the understanding of the risks that they're facing and the financial support to um, you know, rebuild and recover after a disaster. At Aon, we are really working to make sure that our clients have access to the most up-to-date and scientifically credible information in order to create data-driven decision-making around climate change. Data is such a key part in all of the different stakeholders and pressures that insurers are facing right now in order to meet the rising challenge that climate change brings to the industry. From quantifying far forward looking climate change risk to understanding how the energy transition from fossil fuel based economy to more renewable economy to pricing and underwriting products for their policyholders, data underpins all of those different decision points for insurers. And our clients are really looking to be leaders in helping their clients withstand the volatility from increased natural catastrophes that climate change brings to their doorstep. So thank you for this opportunity and really looking forward to the discussion. Liz. Next up, we have Brian Garcia. Brian is the president and CEO of the Connecticut Green Bank, the nation's first state level green bank. The green bank model is demonstrating how smarter use of public resources can attract more private investment in the green energy economy, reducing energy burdens on household and businesses, creating jobs and increasing the deployment of clean energy. Welcome, Brian, and please start your introduction. Great. Thank you, Representative Woods, uh, for your leadership in moderating this panel. And I also want to give a shout out to Commissioner Mays, George, and the Department of Insurance team. Uh, it's only befitting that as the insurance capital of the world uh, that the city of Hartford and the state of Connecticut host this important event that we're having here today. Uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation with my colleagues on paying for uh, resilience. I wanted to start off by introducing the Connecticut Green Bank and providing an overview of the Green Bank model. Uh, then I'll discuss the level of global capital flows towards climate finance and going towards the two pillars of the Paris Agreement, mitigation and adaptation. And lastly, I'll introduce a recently passed policy in Connecticut that enables its green bank to go beyond reducing greenhouse gas emissions through clean energy to include environmental infrastructure where we can invest in climate adaptation and resilience projects. 
The Connecticut Green Bank is the nation's first green bank. It was created through a bipartisan act of legislation in July of 2011. We're a quasi-public agency, which essentially means that we use private sector disciplines to achieve public sector goals. You could think of us as an intermediary between the ambitious climate change policies of the state and the private capital markets we're helping try to attract to enable their investment in our economy. We focus on delivering social and environmental impact for Connecticut as opposed to financial profit. We're celebrating our 10-year anniversary and have invested nearly $300 million of public revenues to mobilize $1.9 billion of private investment for a total of nearly $2.2 billion of investment in Connecticut's green economy. We have a leverage ratio of over $7 of private funds to $1 of public funds, and we invest the public funds. We don't grant it out or give it away. We've helped deploy nearly 500 megawatts of renewable energy that's created over 25,000 jobs in our communities, reduced the energy burden on over 57,000 families and 6,000 businesses, especially within our most vulnerable communities. Uh, we've helped generate over $100 million in state tax revenue and will avoid nearly 10 million metric tons of CO2 causing climate change and helping to avoid $300 million in public health costs as a result of cleaner air. The Green Bank model is a public policy innovation. As we know, the Paris Agreement is a stool with three legs. First, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions to hold the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius. Second, increasing our ability to adapt to the impacts of climate change and foster climate resilience. And lastly, where green banks are a tool making finance flows consistent with mitigation and adaptation. Green banks leverage limited public resources to attract and mobilize multiples of private capital investment. Given uh, green banks provide a variety of tools, including credit enhancements, co-invest in projects or programs, uh, support warehouses and securitizations, and we issue bonds with the goal of attracting and mobilizing more private investment in our growing green economies. Green banks are being developed at the local and state level across the country and at the national level around the world. Green banks are growing and, and an important tool to filling the financing gap for tackling climate change and enabling the energy transition because we de-risk markets for investment from private capital sources. So let's quickly turn our attention to the level of investment needed. Uh, the Climate Policy Institute did a study in 2019 on global climate change capital flows. Approximately $575 billion of climate finance occurred in 2017 through 2018. 93% of that investment, or $532 billion, was in greenhouse gas mitigation. 5% of that investment, or $30 billion, was in adaptation. And the remaining 2% of that investment was in multiple objectives like water and waste, land use, etc. Roughly half of the total investment is from the public sector, and a little less than half is from the private sector, with the majority of that investment or about $310 billion as project debt. So how much investment do we need? Uh, in a Center for American Progress study of the United States, they noted that we need $200 billion of investment a year in the U.S. in renewable energy and energy efficiency to mitigate emissions that cause climate change. A UN study states that we need $6 trillion a year to achieve sustainable development by 2030. These investment targets are equivalent to between $600 to $800 per person per year of investment. In Connecticut, that's between $2 to $3 billion a year. As the Green Bank helps mobilize two to $300 million a year from the $30 million of public resources we receive, that means we need to enable another order of magnitude of investment to achieve that target. In July of this year, Governor Ned Lamont led an effort for the bipartisan passage of legislation that would further expand the mission of the Green Bank beyond clean energy to include environmental infrastructure, which includes climate adaptation and resilience. We not only have the ability to issue 25-year bonds for clean energy, but we now have the ability to issue 50-year bonds for environmental infrastructure. We have access to state support to improve the rating of those bonds up to $250 million. 
and we're currently in a 9 to 12 month planning process to develop a comprehensive plan to identify areas of priority for private capital attraction and mobilization. As part of that process, we're seeking additional private resources, including continuing to issue Green Liberty bonds and developing Green Liberty notes. We know everyday citizens in Connecticut and across the country want a safe and secure investment. And what better than to issue bonds modeled after the war bonds of the 1940s, whose proceeds are invested to confront climate change. And we're seeking additional public revenue support from the federal government as well, including the Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator or the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund through Reconciliation, a pool of $20 billion to support state level green banks. So thank you for having the Connecticut Green Bank as a part of this esteemed panel on paying for resilience. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Marissa Gillette. Marissa is the chairwoman of Connecticut's Public Utilities Regulatory Authority, also known as PURA. Marissa is the former vice president of external relations for the Energy Storage Association, the national trade association representing the energy storage industry. And in that role, Marissa served as the association's executive team, contributing to the organization's overall strategic vision and direction. Marissa, we're happy to have you here. Feel free to start your introduction. Thank you, Representative Wood. I want to add my thanks to Commissioner Mays for hosting this important conversation, and I'm looking forward to continuing the dialogue uh, with my esteemed panelists um, both today and hopefully in the months and years to come. So uh, as Representative Wood mentioned, I currently chair the Connecticut Public Utilities Regulatory Authority, uh, which is the regulatory agency that has uh, cognizance over issues with our electric, gas, and water utilities that are regulated in the state. Um, they're frequently known in other jurisdictions as public service commissions or public utility commissions. But the one common theme here is every state has one. Uh, every state has an agency like mine uh, that has cognizance over uh, these investor-owned utilities. And I think up until about a year ago, uh, Pura, myself, um, and my colleagues had not really considered the overlap of the insurance industry uh, with the regulated entities that we oversee. And so participating in this uh, panel and the months leading up to this important conversation have really crystallized for uh, me in particular, uh, the overlap that there are between uh, the insurance and the energy industries. Uh, Pura has been undertaking an aggressive um, proceeding over the past two years. We're coming up on our two year anniversary mark of our equitable modern grid proceeding really focused at uh, correcting the, um, the long time under, um, under investment in our electric infrastructure. This is coming at a crucial time in the energy industry across the country and really across the globe as we're dealing with issues of climate change and how our infrastructure uh, needs to meet those challenges of today as we increasingly rely on it. One of PIRA's proceedings under our Equitable Modern Grid uh, initiative is particularly focused on reliability and resilience. Uh, in, our in, in the energy industry, and I imagine there may be some overlap uh, in the insurance industry, um, we're talking about major corporations, uh, not just public utilities. Uh, these utilities have evolved um, into multi-jurisdictional, multi-sector, really conglomerates. Uh, and as a result, there's a lot of inertia in our industry. And so as we tackle this question of reliability and resilience moving forward, uh, we're really trying to get the, uh, get the stakeholders to look forward. Uh, and I think there's a lot of overlap and lessons learned that the insurance industry can teach us. For example, all of the forward-looking modeling that you do uh, in our industries today, in the electric industry in particular, our forward-looking modeling is often limited to uh, the question of usage, uh, customer usage, that is, um, and the demand for the product. Uh, while that is an important piece of the equation, we're often lacking um, the other piece of the puzzle, which is what are the externalities uh, that the system is going to face? And, and I think without that missing, without that piece, uh, we're unable to internalize those risks and I think that that's an important conversation that this panel has uh, helped me begin to crystallize. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation today and sharing a few more 
thoughts on how I think our industries can come together uh, to really uh, combat the climate change issue that is facing us all with increasing urgency. Uh, so Representative Wood, thank you for convening this panel and I will turn the mic back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Frank Nutter. Frank is the president of the Reinsurance Association of America, also known as RAA. Frank currently serves on the advisory board of the International Network for the Financial Management of Large-Scale Disasters and the RAND Center on Catastrophic Risk Management and Compensation, and also the University of Cincinnati's Carl H. Lunder III Center for Insurance and Risk Management Advisory Board. Thank you, Frank. We'd love to hear your introduction. Uh, thank you, Representative Wood, and uh, I'd like to join the others in commending the department for the leadership in providing uh, this summit, uh, and specifically to Commissioner Kreidler. Uh, Commissioner Kreidler has been a long advocate for the industry to be more engaged in uh, not only business practices, but advocacy related to climate change, and uh, has been an inspirational leader in that regard. Uh, I'd like to make just a, a few comments, if you will, about the insurance sector and resilience uh, and look forward to the dialogue about all that. Uh, I would start with a comment that, that, that the insurance companies tend to look at climate through the prism of extreme events. So hurricanes, uh, wildfires, tornadoes, uh, that, that's really the way the industry sees or looks at climate, if you will. Uh, and, and yet, what, what I think we're facing is the question of whether or not um, the industry is faced with uninsurable communities uh, because of the risk of climate change that is affecting not just individual structures, but communities. I don't think that's me. I hope, uh, hope not. Uh, my, my point being that, that it's in, the insurance companies insure individual structures. Uh, and therefore, looking at the community as a whole is something that uh, is, is relatively new to the industry with a caveat. And the caveat is that it's long been the case that the leverage point for looking at communities from the industry's perspective are building codes. You know, what could be done uh, in influencing building codes? And I commend the attendees at this program to uh, visit the website of the Institute for Business and Home Safety, which has focused for a number of years on how to improve the uh, responsiveness and resilience, if you will, of individual structures, uh, and now is looking at how communities could deal more with, uh, uh, with, with resilience for the community as a whole. Uh, it, it's, it's probably important to keep in mind that for the most part, uh, public structures uh, are not insured in the insurance industry. Roads and bridges and that kind of thing are not really insured by communities. Now, there are communities and community pools that insure structures, and that's another leverage point, if you will, for the industry, but it's not, it's not how the industry, for the most part, sees climate since it sees it through individual structures and extreme, extreme events. Uh, so the industry is uh, clearly the reinsurance sector is looking at uh, not only looking at developing financial products for green technology uh, so that in fact is facilitating, if you will. I'm sure that Liz, when she talks about Aon's initiatives with uh, its clients, that that's an important part of all that. And I'd like to touch on something that we'll come back to. And that was when, when, we, uh, when we looked early this year about where the leverage points were at the federal level for getting uh, investment in resilience. Uh, we looked at the, uh, the infrastructure package that the Congress is considering, perhaps the reconciliation package, and notwithstanding all the difficult politics around those things that are going on, the reality is there are, there are opportunities there. And I think what we'll see coming out of that is the federal government putting much more money into mitigation and resilience initiatives uh, at that level. We also proposed, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll see passage in all that, uh, the idea of community resilience zones, if you will, identified using FEMA's natural risk index, which looks at vulnerable communities, uh, people that are vulnerable from an economic point of view, and people in communities that are exposed to, uh, to disasters, uh, climate-related disasters. And the idea which we promoted is that we could build upon the idea of, a, of a, the Build America bonds, which were used after the financial crisis to encourage investment by the private sector 
into uh, the economy. This proposal has uh, a feature that encourages the private sector, including the insurance sector, to invest in uh, municipal bonds as well as we'll call them private bonds, but largely the kinds of things that uh, that Melissa, Marissa was talking about, uh, utilities and other kinds of quasi-governmental entities uh, that, uh, that we could see investments in that are featuring uh, resilience as a component of all that. And I look forward to a fuller discussion of, of that idea as well. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna jump into some questions here. I think this would be a good question for Frank, Commissioner Kreidel, and Liz to um, comment on. It is, do, you, do you think insurance companies have a handle on the investment risk of climate change where we stand today? The answer is, uh, is no, and it's not their fault. Uh, it's, it's largely driven because of the, the nature of the system that we have right now. Um, we, we, you know, when you have some of the risk that is outside of the bounds of, of, uh, of the insurance company and uh, they have a, a risk that they're looking at for a defined period of time, uh, and you also have the potential of having uh, government come in and uh, bail out uh, certain types of risk uh, for certain individuals who, may, who most likely were not insured. Um, you you uh, uh, re really complicate the picture. So I'm not pointing a finger at the insurance industry, the PNC industry. It's the nature of how we've structured it as much as anything here in the U.S. Uh, and in particular, because it's not true elsewhere. I think moving toward something that looked a great deal more like an all perils policy uh, would be one step. It's very difficult to do, but when you start to take uh, flood and earthquake and other types of perils out of where there there might be some kind of uh, uh, backup or, or a secondary type of, uh, of coverage rather than an all perils policy, uh, you're making it much more difficult for, for the insurers. So personally, I, I look at the and say that if we could make some changes here, it's making that leap. It's not an easy one because we've become so addicted to the the subsidy of, uh, of from from uh, public entities, uh, which make it that much more difficult um, uh, to to predict uh, losses, um, and we obviously have some real problems with being able to to uh, um, uh, hold, hold insurers accountable for for risks uh, when they have a defined period of exposure. Climate is something that is going to be a long term ongoing. It's not a sudden event. It's a, it's a process of having to have the insurance for an extended period of time. Uh, Commissioner Kreidler, let me uh, uh, associate myself with your comments but uh, and add a couple of things. Uh, if you look at the question about investment uh, as where the companies commit their capital to support their underwriting, so the properties that they insure, uh, it, it is a problem in certain areas where, where in fact, you've got what Commissioner Kreidler refers to and the industry would refer to as adverse selection, is that the people who buy flood insurance are the ones with the highest level risk. So the industry is gun shy about writing flood risk as, again, looking at climate through the prism of, uh, of individual uh, extreme weather events. Uh, the, the idea of a multi-peril policy is, is worth an exploration uh, to see if, in fact, that would provide the diversification of risk so that companies felt more comfortable uh, writing, and this is a climate discussion, but writing earthquake coverage, writing flood insurance coverage, writing an all-perils policy uh, so that you had uh, the benefit of all of that. Uh, the, the second thing would be to look at the idea of community-based insurance, that maybe there are financial products out there. Aon is actually an, an innovator in this area in looking at ideas for uh, providing insurance for individuals, but written on a community basis and tying it together with uh, resilience initiatives or mitigation level initiatives. Uh, if, if your question is focused on the investment portfolio of insurance companies, uh, again, it's a real challenge unless you have some independent parties that are evaluating the climate exposure, however that would be defined, of uh, municipal bonds, uh, corporate uh, bonds, corporate stocks. 
it's very difficult for an insurance company to know uh, what its exposure is in an inv its investment portfolio uh, without some kind of criteria that are established. And, and indeed, you have a number of the rating agencies that are looking at doing just that, which, in, which would in fact influence uh, how, in, how insurance companies invest in, uh, in their investment portfolio. Yeah, I mean, if I might just add in another perspective as well, I think everything um, that you have said is, is exactly right and, and, and hi highlighting a challenge that the industry really has between understanding kind of the extreme event risk, um, relying on the data and tools we already have in place to measure that risk, but now extrapolating that information to more forward-looking view where climate change is starting to change the behavior of the type of events that we're used to ensuring and being able to quantify how that change is going to impact losses that insurance companies might face. But we absolutely have a great product in order to be able to help communities and individuals protect themselves against these events as they occur. Insurance is designed it has all the mechanisms an insurance product has all the mechanisms in it to help individuals and communities invest in resilience because there's an immediate reduction and a quantifiable reduction in the possible loss you might face when, it, when these events occur. And insurance is a great incentivizer to be able to say, we can understand the cost of risk today and we can quantify what the benefit of this investment is. We can work with communities, we can work with individuals in order to create that framework but the biggest challenge I think to being able to do that is that fundamentally people really have a hard time understanding what risk they're actually exposed to and have a hard time measuring and, and understanding the cost of the risk that they're actually exposed to. Individual homeowners really don't understand you know, what amount of flooding they might be exposed to unless they're in you know, a government issued flood zone. Um, and those maps that the government provides are not necessarily based on risk modeling that is more sophisticated in using the latest data. And so you're relying on outdated information. You might not have exposure to the data that can tell you how much hurricane risk, how much flood risk, how much wildfire risk am I really facing in this home um, in order to make appropriate risk management decisions. So the industry really needs to keep exposing that information to individuals and to communities in order to then start the building blocks of how do we create other instruments, whether it's investment in risk reduction infrastructure and risk transfer products to help make sure communities can be resilient as natural catastrophes change in their behavior. Representative Wood, if I could, uh, let me comment on something Liz said. And, and uh, I, I think we need to recognize that the Connecticut Department, Commissioner Kreidler, uh, are under enormous pressure to balance consumer interest and affordability of insurance with increasing risk. Uh, it, it's a it, it's a really difficult thing if you're if you're looking forward and you see uh, or even looking more recent and you see recent events that are clearly creating uh, a, a more a higher risk profile and the insurance companies are coming in asking for premiums to reflect what they view as the risk profile. Uh, the department and, and Commissioner Kreidler are good examples of trying to balance that uh, that that issue of affordability of insurance products for for consumers with uh, with a climate that's changing and creating additional risk. Yes, we're definitely experiencing that um, at the ground level with uh, you know constituents' needs. I, I want to follow up on the modeling. Um, th this I think is directed at Liz and Frank again. What is the distinction between climate modeling and catastrophe modeling? And how are they being integrated for projecting the impact of climate change on insurance risks? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. And I think it's a really important distinction for people, especially um, all of the stakeholders in, in 
finding solutions to mitigate against climate risk is really understanding what tools do we have at our disposal to quantify what the risk is today and how it's going to change in the future. The insurance industry, as Frank mentioned, you know, when they think of climate risk, really, we are attuned to natural catastrophe event-driven risk. And the tools that we use to quantify what that risk is at an individual home, um, at the community level, for insurance portfolios, are catastrophe models. CAT models use historical observational data in order to build a set of scientifically probable events that may happen next year. Um, they're really great tools to help us understand and quantify the impact that climate change has had already on the frequency and severity of natural catastrophes and are the most appropriate tools to understand kind of near-term risk from climate change or weather-related disasters. Um, the reason that these tools are so embedded in how insurers quantify risk is because they create very high resolution insights and risk location specific information around how structures are going to respond when they're exposed to um, flooding waters, high wind speeds, wildfire risk. We have detailed engineering information and studies that we can bring in to help be able to say one house might be vulnerable to a certain degree in a wildfire, but if a homeowner makes investments in things like um, hardy board, siding, uh, non-burnable roof material, we can use those cat models to actually quantify what the benefit is from a loss perspective, and insurers can then use that information to embed it into their rates and into their underwriting guidelines. Now, those tools have been used by the insurance industry for decades to do exactly that analysis and have been used for underwriting and pricing decisions for a long time. But now we're being asked to bring in a forward-looking view of climate change. Climate change models typically rely on global scale information that are far forward-looking. So if you think about um, climate change data as you know, really trying to understand how does carbon uh, emissions and carbon in the atmosphere affect global mean temperature change. And then we need to take in the insurance space, we need to be able to take that information and link it to how does global mean temperature change impact the frequency and severity of an event. And then can we actually understand how does event behavior begin to change under different future versions of our environment? These are really complex scientific problems that we're trying to answer by bringing that forward-looking climate change data that's so critical in any kind of business planning or forward-looking view of climate risk into the tools that allow us to understand the impact of climate on pricing, underwriting, and portfolio management. So the difference really is in scale and timeline. Uh, Representative Wood, if I could just uh, supplement, uh, Liz did an excellent job of uh, just of answering your, your question. Uh, part of the tension here is that uh, the, the insurance business model is largely a retrospective one. It, it's built upon historical loss information as Liz referenced. Uh, it's trended forward, usually with economic data, if you will, cost of living and that kind of thing. The climate models, of course, are very forward looking. So finding that intersection that uh, allows the integration of, uh, of climate models, which have a spatial and temporal difference, if you will, than the insurance model is really the challenge of all of that. The modeling companies and, and companies like Aon uh, that do modeling as well, uh, are doing a good job of trying to integrate what the science community believes to be uh, forward-looking information and all of that. But, but it is a challenge, and, and it's a challenge, again, for insurance departments. Commissioner Kreidler could speak to this about using models, if you will, using these uh, analytical models that we're talking about into the rating process when you're looking at forward-looking information, which uh, is evolving, if you will. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner, did you want to add anything? Uh, well, thanks. Absolutely correct. You know, I think it's it's really it's really really trying to uh, to get to that projection, and certainly mitigation and and uh, is one of the major steps and uh, that we've got to take uh, 
uh, looking forward. You, you can't uh, build, a, build a risk model under static uh, uh, simulation that uh, what happened in the past is what we can expect in the future. And uh, as you look to the future and you take into account the climatic changes that are taking place uh, and will take place, uh, you've got to, to find some way to make sure that the that the insurance products that are being developed are being constructed in such a way that they really take into account uh, uh, those kind of, of changes, not just what's happened in the past, but what can happen in the future. Um, I think the, the, the National Flood Insurance Program's uh, maps that they develop are perhaps maybe one of the best examples that uh, they tend to be written on a fairly static uh, previous experience world and not nearly as uh, forward thinking or, or looking as they need to be. That's the same challenge that insurance companies have and it's got to be one that uh, is uh, not uh, rewarded going forward and it's one that uh, regulators need to take into account as they try to price out to make, a, make an assumption I should say as to the particular products being offered in a particular market that uh, that it's fair and reasonable for for the charges that are being made. Uh, the other part, the other part of this is certainly making sure that uh, that you don't tie an insurance company uh, just to to here and now, particularly when it comes to uh, some of the mitigation efforts that are that are required and and uh, uh, some of the uh, more uh, solid construction that might be necessary that. Uh, um, that as you build that into uh, uh, a new structure, you obviously increase the, the insurance costs, uh, which are counterproductive to, a, to somebody who says, well, I'm taking all these steps so you don't have losses, uh, yet you're charging me more. And I think it's trying to, to understand that you, you've, got, uh, um, you, you've got to have a longer look than just a 12 months period. Uh, it's got to be some way of being able to tie it. Now, how do we do that? Is something that's going to require some real imagination to have products that go beyond the standard uh, term as we would know it today. Uh, Representative Wood, I'm, if I can add one more comment to that, I know you've got other questions. Uh, several of us, including me, have referenced the National Flood Insurance Program and uh, the kind of blunt instrument that the mapping that's done is for particularly giving uh, guidance to, to people about whether they're in or out of a flood zone. Uh, the uh, FEMA uh, is, uh, has developed and putting into uh, implementation October 1st a, what's called Risk Rating 2.0, which in fact gets away from uh, the broad mapping that uh, perhaps is misleading to people about where their flood risk is since it's a, one of those classic examples of a climate-related extreme event. And Risk Rating 2.0 is designed to be more property-specific about what the risk profile is. It's a really positive development. That's really great to hear. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to move on to uh, another question that is geared towards uh, Chairwoman Gillette. Uh, what is, what role can the insurance industry play in helping utilities and ratepayers invest in modernizing the grid and its infrastructure? Uh, Representative Wood, thank you for the question. Um, and I can uh, try to tie this back to a little bit of what we heard, um, particularly in Liz's remarks just a few minutes ago, um, the intersection of the affordability product and some of the modeling that you were talking about. And I think so far we've heard about a lot about designing products for individuals or municipalities. Um, but to take a step backwards, I, I think that there could be um, some uh, overlap between the insurance industry and the utility, excuse me, the utilities that are ser serving these states um, as a whole and working to design um, products at that level uh, or um, being cognizant of what we're doing at the state level for this infrastructure that's serving all our constituents um, to see how that can trickle down to the formation of these individual products and the affordability of those products. So what I mean by that is um, if in Connecticut, for example, Pure has put a lot of um, thought into uh, programs that work to decentralize the grid and thus increase the resilience of the individual homeowner, homeowner or the individual 
municipality or individual community. Um, I think that there's some overlap there with the formation of individual policies. Um, for example, is there uh, any benefit um, to your homeowner's policy uh, if you have taken advantage of a state program um, that allows you to operate as a nano grid? You have solar and storage, for example. Um, and while that, um, you know, providing for that resiliency through customers' electric bills um, may have a, an affordability impact there, um, perhaps it has a, an inverse affordability impact in the creation of these insurance products. So I, I think that there is like a relationship that we can explore there. Um, and then to get back to your question about how uh, in the inverse, how the insurance industry could help um, uh, ratepayers afford these massive statewide investments in this infrastructure. Um, I think that we could start by really benefiting from uh, the modeling that you all have talked through that I think, to be frank, the, in, uh, the insurance industry is out ahead of where we are in the in energy industry in terms of um, uh, creating some of these models that are, are more forward-looking. Uh, so I've been a big proponent um, through some of our regulatory proceedings about looking at this question of uh, forward-looking reliance on, on uh, these models to create a new cost-benefit um, structure so that the question isn't so much to the utility in today's age, is it cheaper to throw up a new pole and wire to correct for the, um, the outage that we have right now? Or is it more cost beneficial long term to invest in a combination of uh, undergrounding or some of these resilience measures that, uh, that stand up to um, flood prone zones, for example? So um, I think that there's you know, some uh, direct and indirect ways that we can either take lessons learned from your industry or we can have a more um, uh, give and take between the two industries and get creative in the formation of these products. So it's a really great question. And I think this is just the start of that conversation. So thank you. Uh, Commissioner Wick, can I comment on Marissa's uh, question about that? Um, in, in this proposal that I referenced in my opening comments about this community disaster resilience zone, uh, there are really two types of bonds that, that we feel like could be targeted here to attract private investment. So think investment from insurance companies or banks or pension funds or whatever it would be. Uh, one of the traditional municipal obligations that would be more like the Build America bonds uh, of the past uh, where the federal government would provide a financial incentive, if you will, a, a a, a, a reward, if you will, for purchasing those bonds. But the other is what we would call private activity bonds. So utilities would be a good example of that. And, and the proposal is that uh, communities could issue tax exempt obligations uh, to finance, help finance private activities like utilities or water districts or school districts or those kinds of entities that, that are in these zones, if you will, these identified zones uh, where the, the bonds would have an attraction, if you will, because uh, they, they would be attracted to be purchased in the private sector, but really for local uh, local projects. So the kinds of things that Marissa mentioned would, would fit well within this idea. So we're, we're hopeful this will get included in the infrastructure package. If it doesn't, we're hopeful that the Congress will consider this as another feature of targeting public and private investment, if you will, into resilience projects like Marissa mentioned. Uh, so the next question I want to ask is, um, how are regulators expecting organizations to measure, assess, mitigate, and disclose climate-related financial risks? And why are these financial disclosures so important? I'll open that up to the entire panel. Well, I'll jump in <laughs> as the only regulator here at the moment. Uh, um, Commissioner Mays isn't with us at this point, so <laughs> uh, let, let me say that uh, you know we're, 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 uh, we're, we we clearly want to have uh, an understanding on on several scores, not the least of which is the fact that uh, we want to make sure that uh, that the kind of investments that are being made by insurance companies are are ones that uh, uh, are not going to be negatively impacted because of uh, climatic changes, meaning uh, 
when I started as insurance commissioner and probably when Frank got, uh, got started, uh, a fairly solid type of investment uh, was uh, were bonds for, uh, for, for utilities uh, built around uh, electrical power generation uh, that were based on coal. Um, well, uh, that 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 you know now uh, it can, it's clear that uh, coal-fired electrical generation is uh, gone the wa gone the way of the Edsel. It is not going to be around. It is not around any longer, and it's uh, it was one that was doomed, not because of uh, of uh, regulators, not because uh, of uh, the arbitrary decisions that we were going to move away from a coal-based. Uh, um, electrical generation because of natural gas, which is also carbon uh, producing into the atmosphere, but at a much lower rate than what we have. So what was a solid investment a few years ago became uh, a really uh, negative investment uh, in day. And we want to make sure companies are not uh, tied to the kind of investment portfolio that looked good uh, 20 years ago, but uh, um, and some of these bonds obviously can be for extended periods of time, uh, but much less. I would say that from what I've, I've witnessed from the reporting that we've seen, which is part of why we do the reporting, uh, that we're getting a much clearer picture that the industry is moving rapidly away from those kind of, uh, of stranded investments that could really be uh, problematic. But they've also got to move toward making sure that they're not in the game of insuring a particular area uh, ge geographically or um, that would, uh, they're here today and they say, you know what, but you know, this is a fairly short underwriting cycle, let's say one year. And if we uh, don't like the, the direction we go, we will we'll either increase the cost or drop the market. And that's something that uh, becomes seriously problematic uh, like uh, Representative Wood, I spent many years in the state legislature, and I can tell you right now, when you start hearing from constituents about having to pay an arm and a leg for their insurance over what they've paid in the past, uh, it's not a pretty picture. Or if the insurance company says, we're out of this market, we're not going to write here anymore, that's a real problem. Uh, that will not be sustainable. So making sure we understand just exactly how and what the insurance industry is doing relative to both its underwriting and insuring practices, but also its investment practices are critical uh, to, to all regulators, but I believe to us as a society too. Uh, Commissioner Kreidler, if I could uh, comment on, on your comments. Uh, the, the NAIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, uh, really took a leadership role some significant number of years ago about disclosure related to climate. Uh, and uh, Commissioner Kreidler and the commissioners in, uh, I believe, New York and uh, California, maybe others, have, have provided some aggregation and a release of that information. I think one of the concerns the industry has now is that a concern that we're on the cusp of a proliferation of data reporting to try and get this information. We we support data reporting, but now the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, is likely to require public companies to provide disclosure. The TCFD that uh, Commissioner Kreidler referenced earlier is widely used in the European community and certainly by a number of U.S. companies and reporting uh, and disclosure, if you will. The Federal Insurance Office has taken a first step toward asking the question of whether they should be uh, collecting data on all this. I think from the industry's perspective, what you want is some uniformity or some recognition of other systems of data reporting uh, so that it doesn't become an administrative burden. But it is a valuable tool to, for the companies as well as the regulators to see where the industry has exposure and for the companies to recognize that uh, where their exposure is as well. Anyone else want to add to that? Maybe I would just pick up there and say it's possible that the insurance industry, this is another w way that we can seek to marry the insurance and the energy industries. Because um, as an economic regulator of these utilities, we're, in we're putting an increasing reliance on data reporting um, to make sure that the return on investment that, that our ratepayer dollars are going into these resilience measures uh, are yielding a quantifiable benefit. So. 
um, you know, we're historically designing these uh, grid resilience programs uh, using what is called blue sky data, um, data that's collected from days like today where the sun's shining and the there's no wind blowing. Um, and uh, the industry is trying to move towards creating these metrics that uh, can capture more of the resilience benefits to the individual consumer um, or the individual feeders or circuits. So if you're turning to your partners um, in state government at your regulatory commissions and asking them, what data are you collecting uh, that could be uh, you know, leveraged to create um, uh, or to look at some more of these uh, potential products um, rather than instituting new data reporting requirements, uh, I think there's some um, you know, beneficial uh, marriage that could happen uh, there. So um, yeah, that's just another plug for uh, looking to work together moving forward because I think there's a lot that you all have talked about um, already that I was unaware of um, from, from your side of the table. So look forward to learning more, thank you. Thank you. We will move on to the next question. Uh, Connecticut has emphasized the Justice 40 initiative, which promotes equity in federal investment projects while making our most vulnerable residents more resilient to the impacts of climate change. What types of financial innovation can the insurance industry provide to reduce the protection gap for those vulnerable communities who might find themselves uninsured? Uh, Representative Wood, if I can jump in first in all of that, and I, I'm going to come back to what I've referenced a couple of times in this proposal for the community disaster resilience zones. Uh, the, the core of it is FEMA's National Risk Index, which has a social vulnerability component to it. This obviously features the 18 perils that it covers. Uh, we, we took that information and added to it census information. Uh, looking at income levels and uh, housing stock, if you will, as a way to identify where you might target uh, these investment bonds that I've mentioned a couple of times in socially vulnerable communities, uh, as well as communities that are exposed to disaster risk. I think the point here is that there are analytical tools, we've used them, analytical tools available at the federal level, perhaps at the state level, but, but uh, we can, we've done data modeling, if you will, with all this and can provide information at the census track level, looking at social vulnerability, economic vulnerability, and where investments would make a difference in terms of disaster, extreme event exposure uh, by state, uh, by, as I say, census track, uh, by congressional district. So I, I, we feel like there, there are tools, in fact, that can achieve the kinds of goals you're talking about in terms of social equity uh, and looking at climate risk and extreme uh, weather risk. If I might uh, join in too, I, I would just point out that, uh, you know, one of the real challenges we're going to face as a society, and it can't be laid entirely, they can play, they'll play a role, but uh, a very major role is gonna be for society because you're talking about uh, um, buffeting uh, against uh, climate change, uh, some of our most vulnerable populations, uh, and that's not an easy task to do. Um, the, the, you've got to find some way of being able to, particularly now with the, the problems of the, the homeless population and uh, housing in general, uh, the last thing you want to do is to uh, make it much more difficult for people to to, to either rent or own a, a home and have a place to live other than on the streets. Uh, and that's a challenge. Uh, so that's, that's gonna be a, a societal thing. The challenge I think you have for insurance is, is to make sure that, the, that when, they, when they, they are prepared to stand behind um, the, their underwriting and say, we will insure this product that it's not a short-term uh, um, promise, it's a long-term commitment uh, that they're there to make it. And the finances are not set up to, uh, for that currently. Can we structure it in such a way so it is more long-term? Uh, the second is, is that they're gonna make sure that you take care of that structure that's not necessarily making it cheaper uh, and more affordable for the individuals that are struggling to find housing. Um, so you, You've got to, it's going to be a real balance. I mean, the NFIP's uh, uh, real challenge here right now is is that you, is they move toward a real um, 
price-based uh, uh, costing out of, of the, the, their, their product, it's, uh, it becomes clearer and clearer that they're pricing out the affordability of uh, flood insurance to some of the people that need it the most because they're the most vulnerable at the same time, should they even be building there, and what kind of standards uh, do they employ. And many of these structures have certainly been around for a long time, even before we were acknowledging the fact that uh, climate change was on, on the path and come and breathing down the back of our neck. This is Brian. I, I think my I think my camera's working now. Uh, forgive me all. Um, I just wanted to follow the commissioner there. Um, you know, in the area of environmental justice, uh, climate justice, social justice, uh, energy justice, there's something that we we call energy burden in the context of uh, energy, which is the percentage of household income spent on energy. Um, an affordable energy burden uh, is no more than 6% of household income spent on energy. Um, and our low to moderate income families can in fact spend uh, 10, 15, 20% or more of their household income on energy, which makes energy unaffordable uh, or creates an affordability gap. Um, what percent of household income is spent on insurance is kind of a question, right? So, you know, what is the insurance burden or protection gap for the most vulnerable? Uh, in Connecticut, uh, thanks to the leadership of Representative Woods, you know, we have policy definitions for vulnerable communities. Um, in Connecticut, the insured value of coastal property is $754 billion, uh, which is 66% of the state's total insured value. So that's more than $1.1 trillion of insured value. Uh, the question that I have is, is what's the value of uninsured property in Connecticut? What's the protection gap for vulnerable communities? Uh, if insurance is a mechanism to improve our resilience to the impacts of climate change, then how do we ensure that our most vulnerable communities have access to it? Uh, we have innovations in finance um, in the clean energy space that completely eliminates the energy affordability gap that I was talking about for our most vulnerable communities uh, through a combination of incentives and financing uh, that, that promotes what uh, Chair Gillette was saying in terms of solar PV, uh, energy efficiency, uh, you know, storage uh, in lease structures. And when we build all that together, not only are we mitigating emissions, but we are improving the resilience um, to power outages for the most vulnerable. So uh, it is upon all of us to ensure that, uh, again, the economy we're building and how we confront climate change uh, enables the most vulnerable to become more re resilient and to benefit from it the most. If I could uh, supplement that, um, one of the things that we've advocated for as part of uh, National Flood Insurance Program reauthorization and reform uh, is a voucher program. Uh, so that uh, people that own structures uh, get a, a clear message about what the risk profile is, uh, but if they are uh, socially or economically vulnerable, that they would be, uh, they would qualify for a voucher program. It's not uncommon in federal programs to have something like that, so that people can stay in their homes and not be, uh, not, not be shuttered out of their homes because of the cost of insurance, certainly. I'm, I'm not familiar with what energy costs would be, but we do think that there is a way to solve the problem of sending the message of what the risk is through the insurance premium, uh, but providing vouchers for those that really have uh, uh, economic need. Great. I, I wanted to follow up with another question um, for Brian, but anyone else, feel free to jump in. Is there a role for green banks to work with the insurance industry? I would say absolutely there's a role for green banks to work with the insurance industry. I think Frank has uh, encouraged that with the Build America bonds and thinking about uh, how we uh, engage in our municipal bond markets to ensure that there are opportunities for insurance companies to invest and provide the necessary capital to invest in the infrastructure that we want to see. Um, you know, I was talking a little bit before about the green liberty bonds. Um, so in Connecticut, 
you know, we have the ability to issue bonds to support and finance clean energy improvements. Uh, we now have the ability to finance uh, resilience and adaptations by issuing bonds up to 50 years. Um, and we issue those bonds to the private markets, you know, insurance companies, pension funds. Uh, we also issue them to citizens. Uh, we, we feel it's important to uh, make sure that these bonds are retail accessible so that citizens in our economy have, can also uh, confront the climate crisis through our system of capitalism. Um, so there's absolutely opportunities for us to partner with the insurance industry, uh, taking the lessons learned uh, from both uh, sectors and figuring out how uh, we might mobilize more private investment in the green economy we want to create. Anyone else want to jump in? I, I might jump in quickly and try to combine, uh, build off of what Brian just said in response to this question, as well as how Frank ended that last question. Um, in Connecticut, which I don't think it's a unique problem, a lot of our housing uh, stock is uh, not owned, it's it's rented. We have a, um, upwards of like 40% of our single family homes in Connecticut are rented as a statistic that I heard recently. And I wonder if they're, um, you know, listening to all the good ideas that have come out of the conversation today, there's an opportunity for, um, you know, Brian and the Green Bank and the insurance industry to uh, leverage those um, those bonds and vouchers to kind of crack the nut that uh, I don't think any uh, regulatory energy commission has cracked across the country and bridging that um, what we uh, have never been able to bridge in terms of the lack of incentive for a landlord to act in making the individual housing stock more resilient, um, when it, especially when it's their uh, tenant who's paying, you know, the energy bill. Um, so perhaps targeting, um, you know, a marriage of uh, an insurance um, product, presumably the the landlord still paying the uh, insurance for, um, you know, the the property. Uh, with um, some, you know, we've we've come up with all kinds of incentives uh, to try to encourage the landlord mm -hmm. to make the property more energy efficient um, or more energy resilient. So uh, perhaps there's a way that you know, I think the uh, Green Bank in Connecticut is um, is not yet replicated to to the degree it's been so successful in Connecticut, but uh, we could certainly be a, a leader here in trying to show how uh, the Green Bank and and the insurance industry could. Um, come together to solve what, what is really an age-old problem of the, the landlord-tenant um, issue. So thank you. Great. Um, last question I'm going to ask is, are there any opportunities at the national level to provide incentives for local communities to invest in resilience? And I'll start with Commissioner Kreidler. What? There definitely are, um, uh, and I think we're we're going to start to see a great deal more of that uh, take place. And it's going to be uh, going to take a lot of handholding uh, because you're going to you're going to, particularly when you deal with such is issues as wildfire, which are much more of a, of a peril, climate driven peril for us here in the Northwest. Uh, when you start telling people that uh, what they have to do with their own property. Um, it sometimes becomes, uh, there's some resistance, something like uh, immunizations for some people, uh, that there's uh, this built-in resistance uh, to it because, not because they doubt uh, the science, it's because I don't want to be told what to do. And I said, geez, it sounds just like my three-year-old, but uh, many years ago. Uh, but uh, it, it is clearly one where, where uh, we've got to, to, to start to build in the kind of incentives to to, uh, to, to communities uh, so you don't have uh, the kind of isolated community like we did in Paradise, California that can be wiped out uh, by, uh, by a firestorm that uh, rushed through that area. Uh, we've been lucky knocking on wood. We haven't had another one like that uh, since Paradise a couple of years ago um, because that's the kind of uh, buffeting that we have to build into the system and that means uh, building uh, the kind of open spaces, not having the uh, people move to certain areas because they, they really like the trees and uh, want them up close to their houses. And uh, all of a sudden, that's the biggest liability that they face. You've got to build in the incentives. If you want insurance, this is what you're going to have to 
uh, to build in in the way of accommodation. And there has to be a way of monitoring and maintaining those standards over time so it's not one that erodes. But it's going to be, uh, I listened to public uh, radio just uh, the earlier this week talk about uh, uh, somebody complaining in, Cal in Oregon, just to the south of us, about uh, about you're not going to take down my my big my favorite big uh, um, fir tree out front because uh, I, that, that's why I love this house and I'm going well you know as long as we hold on to those and there aren't any penalties associated with it it's a problem I think the penalties have to be in many cases tied if you want insurance you've got to make these kind of changes and I think we've got to build it into society and I think that's Kind of what you got to do with the immigration, with with the immunization crowd, and say if you want to be able to go to the professional football game, uh, you've got to have proof of uh, that you have the vaccine. Uh, you, in this case, you've got to prove that you've uh, buffeted your house enough uh, and property enough against uh, uh, wildfire uh, to to allow an insurance company to come in and accept that risk. Uh, Representative Wood, uh, the comment I would make uh, as well is that uh, if you look to the tax code, uh, the federal tax code, if you're looking for incentives for the states to work together uh, at the federal level uh, on this, uh, that's why we promoted the idea of this Build America bonds as uh, taxable bonds, if you will, but with a federal subsidy on those bonds to make them attractive for private investment. The second part were these tax exempt obligations for private activity things, not unlike the utilities or school districts that I mentioned before. Uh, and the third proposal that we have as part of all this is that uh, the IRS would in fact evaluate uh, such, uh, such bonds for purposes of the savings associated uh, with uh, lowering disaster assistance cost after these events and use that as a tax credit that could be transferable, tradable, uh, something that uh, communities uh, in issuing these obligations uh, would get the benefit of uh, of, a, of a tax credit, if you will, that could be uh, could be sold, help fund what they want to do. So I, I think there are a lot of ways to look at federal tax um, uh, commitments, uh, federal tax provisions to provide incentives for local communities and states to do the right thing and in investments in resilience but provide incentives for uh, insurance companies, banks, pension funds, and others to invest in it. And, and just building off of Frank's uh, comments here, I, I think as we're all awaiting uh, what's going to happen in Congress with respect to the bipartisan infrastructure framework or, or reconciliation, that if we look back, there are a number of things that we can do today or policies we can act on today. The one that comes to my mind uh, is the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977. So in, in this context, what uh, the policy is trying to do is to encourage FDIC insured financial institutions, uh, credit unions, uh, communities community banks, state banks, you know, regional, federal banks to lend to a low to moderate income communities, less than 50% uh, area median income, uh, moderate income communities, 50 to 80% AMI. Uh, so this is a tool that we have today. Um, in Connecticut, we have a product that we call uh, the Smarty Loan, which is to support the state's comprehensive energy strategy. Uh, and over the last seven years, we've enabled $100 million of financing from our local community banks and credit unions to help homeowners improve uh, their energy performance by putting insulation in the walls, putting solar on the rooftops, putting batteries in their homes, uh, and becoming more energy efficient. Um, and by using simply the strength of the Green Bank's balance sheet, the only thing we've had to do is to provide a second loan loss guarantee. Uh, we've only had to pay $75,000 in losses. So the idea that the state would pay $75,000 and the private uh, sector would invest $100 million, those are the types of numbers we need to be moving to towards to enable more private investment in the economy we want to see. Anyone else? Great. Well, I just want to thank the uh, team at the Connecticut Insurance Department for hosting this panel. And many thanks to the panel members for making this such a dynamic discussion. I know we could have gone on for at least another hour. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining.